So the script 6a will teach you how to import data. So far, we've used data from the Earth Engine data catalog. The catalog is quite vast, but again, there'll always be a need to merge that public domain data with your own data set. Earth Engine allows you to import any of your data set into Earth Engine and combine it with other data sets. If we switch to the assets tab here, you can see that uh, you have your assets folder. If you do not have, if you have never uploaded any asset, you might see a button create an asset home folder. You can click that button. Uh, you'll see an uh, asset folder like this. This is an older style assets folder. The newer style uh, assets folder would be linked to your cloud project. Each user has, if you click uh, next to this button next to your assets folder, uh, there's it says quota. If you click on it, it'll show you how much quota you have. Each user gets 250 gigabyte of free storage into Earth Engine. So you can upload data up to that limit into Earth Engine and uh, use it along with the data. What are you able to upload? If you click this new button, you can see you can upload images as GeoTIFF files. If you have purchased high resolution images, or if you have some other data, elevation data, or other data set that you want to use in Earth Engine, you can upload it to your own account. Uh, remember that when you upload anything to Earth Engine, it's private only to you. It's a similar concept as Google Drive. Like when you upload something, it's private to you. You can choose to share it with your colleagues or make it public if you wish to. Otherwise, it's private to you, but you can combine it with other public data sets. If you have polygons, lines, etc., uh, of your own uh, regions, and you want to upload vector data, you can have a shape file or a CSV file that you can import into Earth Engine. And again, this becomes a feature collection that you can combine in Earth Engine. So let's learn how to import this data. We're going to import this particular data set. This is uh, the website of one of the states in India. They share some geographic data. Uh, we want to work with some admin boundaries. We saw that the Earth Engine has some admin boundaries. We worked with admin one and admin two boundaries earlier. But let's say I want to work with some other admin four boundaries. So these are the Taluk boundaries in uh, the state of India. Uh, they are similar to admin four in your region. And this website gives you a shapefile. And I want to use this in Earth Engine. So you can download the shapefile and use it. Similarly, you can uh, download any shape files and upload to Earth Engine that you wish to. Also, for a lot of regions uh, in India, a lot of the districts, the boundaries keep changing, districts keep splitting and merging. So you may want to have the latest boundaries of even the admin regions that are there in Earth Engine might be old. So we are downloading the Taluk boundaries and we'll download the zip file to your computer. The zip file will look like this. You can see I have a zip file. Once you have the file downloaded, please go and unzip it. So I'm going to unzip it to a folder. And this folder now contains this uh, four files, which consist of a shape file. Uh, let's check this file in QGIS on a computer to just review what this file looks like. I'm going to open this shape file into this computer. You can see this is the state of Karnataka in India. And we have polygons for each of those subdistrict polygons. I'm going to open the attribute table of this data. And you can see there are 227 admin units in the state. We have the name of the state, uh, admin unit. So this is the admin unit. And we have some other attributes. We have this attribute of area. So this is the area in square meters. Uh, this is the periphery and uh, perimeter and so on. All right, so we have this data and I want to use this in Earth Engine. We want to compute the average yearly rainfall in each of those districts. That's the goal. So I want to upload this to Earth Engine. So we'll uh, take the shapefile and upload it. For folks who have not worked with shapefile before, it's an ancient data format that, though it's called a shapefile, each shapefile actually can consist of multiple files. And you need all the files for the shapefile to be complete. So in this case, we have four files. You need a minimum of these four files to exist for a shapefile to be complete. So when somebody says upload a shapefile, they actually mean upload all your shapefiles. Right? So upload all your files which come along with that. The main file is called .shp, and the other files are called sidecar files. And I think there are 
uh, I don't remember how many, but maybe 20 or so sidecar files that can exist depending on what the requirement are. So again, you need minimum of these four files and you can upload that. Earth Engine allows you to upload a zip file consisting of those four files directly. But if you have even one extra file, which is not a supported sidecar file, you'll get an error. So I always recommend that you always unzip your shapefile and select the individual shapefiles uh, that make up the full file and upload that. So always unzip it. Uh, you'll have a less chance of getting an error when you upload that. Let's switch back to the code editor. I'm going to switch to the assets tab and go to the new button and select shapefile. Here it says select files. It gives us the list of allowed extensions. So if you are uploading zip file, you should have only these files inside of a zip file. If you are uploading individual files, make sure that they are, there are no other files except the supported extension. I'm going to click the select button and select this four files. You can hold the shift key and select all of it. So I have selected all four of this. You can select what's the name of your asset. So if your asset I, uh, folder looks like this, the default name will be based on the file name. This is Taluk boundary, that's fine. And once you have this, you can click the upload button. Yeah, I want all of you to try this. So go to your code editor, switch to the assets tab, click new, shape file, and upload these four files to your Earth Engine account. Once you click upload, you will see that this task tab turns yellow. If I switch to task tab, it says there is an unsubmitted task that's pending here. Now, at first, the files will go from your computer to the Google service, and that's the upload part. For that duration, you have to be connected to the internet and to Earth Engine servers. Once the files are uploaded, you'll see this gear icon spinning that is the ingestion taking place. That is the files are being now converted into the Earth Engine format and will be added to your account. Uh, this process can take anywhere from a couple of minutes to you know, maybe 10, 15 minutes, depending on the complexity of your file. So for that point, you can close your Earth Engine tab and you know, do something else, right? So once the gear starts spinning, it's the internal processing that's happening. You need to wait for this to finish before you can use it as it. So all of you should be now going to Assets tab, new, Shape file and upload the files. Once the gear starts spinning, please give me a thumbs up. Yes, that's the question. The cloud assets are kind of linked to a Google Cloud project that is linked to your Earth Engine account. That is how the, uh, the Earth Engine integration would uh, require you to have the cloud account in the future. Uh, the legacy assets are kind of the old Earth Engine assets that are still there. I have bulk of my assets in the legacy folder, so I continue uploading there. But I think if you have a cloud project, you can, you should be able to use that without a problem. The advantage of the cloud asset is that you can purchase additional quota. So in the old world, 250 GB was the limit. Once you reach the limit, uh, you are out of luck. So in the cloud world, you are able to purchase uh, more storage uh, if you have Earth Engine commercial account. So especially for commercial users, it gives some additional benefits around sharing and purchasing additional quota. But for individual users, I think either is fine. So you can see my ingestion finished. It took about two minutes. And once I get this uh, check mark, I can go to my assets tab and go and find where I uploaded the assets. I have a version of this asset already uploaded here. So you can see I have this asset here. And that uh, once I see the asset here, that means my asset is ready to use. I can click on it to see some more information. It shows me kind of a bounding box of the asset extents. I can see the individual features that were uploaded. Remember, when you upload a shape file, it becomes a feature collection. So each individual polygon became a feature. And I have don't have a description here, and it has a file size, number of features, etc. When I uploaded it, it's a private asset only for me. If I click the share button here, it'll bring up the sharing setting. Right now you can see I am the owner and uh, nobody else has other access. There's a box here, anyone can read. 
If you want this asset to be publicly readable, you can click this one. Since we are using this asset in the course, I have made it anyone can eat. So it's a publicly shared asset. That means if I use it in a script and I send you a scripting, you can read the asset. If you are asking for help in a public forum or emailing us with a question and you have uploaded your asset, make sure you have checked this so that uh, you can run your script. If you do not want to share it publicly and you just want to share it with your collaborator, you can enter the email address. So I can say, I can enter Vigna's address here. I can choose to give her read access or write access. Click this and click done. And then she'll have read and uh, write access to that asset if I wanted to. Sometimes uh, if it's been more than a few minutes and your gear is still spinning, it sometimes helps to click this refresh button here. Refresh asset cache. It just refreshes uh, the asset processing and you'll see the check boxes appear. So, uh, I've seen in the past, sometimes the asset is done processing, but you can still see the gear spinning. In that case, you can click this refresh button and you will see the asset completed. So from the assets tab, you can see I had uploaded my asset here and it's ready. Once it's ready, I can hover over the asset and click this button here. There's an arrow that says import into script. And if I click on this, you'll see that it comes into my code editor and a variable table is assigned to it. So at this point, it's just like any other feature collection that we have in our engine. Right? We've imported that into a script and we can do anything with it. I'm going to rename this variable as star looks. And let's take a look. So I'm going to add it to the map. And if I zoom in, I can see that the shape file that we had uploaded is now in our engine. It has become a feature collection. I can inspect individual polygons and I'll see that this is the value of this. All the attributes that we had in the attribute table, they become properties of individual features. So now we are able to use this as any of the feature collection. We can uh, clip our collection with it. We can use those polygons to do something with it. I'm going to just make it style slightly different. Let's assign a gray color and we'll just say, also it's sometimes a good idea to just take a look at the individual features. When you upload it in image collection or a feature collection and I want to see feature, uh, you can use this first function. You can say taluk.first, show me the first feature. I just want to look at what the one feature looks like. So you can see there's a polygon and there are some properties. Let's say we want to uh, do some manipulation. We have this field here. We have this field which contains the area in square meters. We want to convert this into square kilometers. And add a new property. So it is similar to if you're working with a shapefile in a GIS, I want to add a new column where I will take value from one column and do some computation and add a new column to it. This is fairly common process that you need to do to manipulate your data. How do we do this? Well, in Earth Engine, when you want to apply something to all features in a feature collection, that is a map operation. So you write a function that takes one feature, adds your new property, and then map that function on your collection. Let's see how we can do that. So first we'll write a function. I'll write a function called function as add area. We'll define the function. The input to this function will be a feature. So I'll assign the variable f to it. So when we map this function on the feature collection, it'll be run on each feature. This function will be called with the each feature and you can do something with each feature and return a new feature with the added property. So we, we already have the area, let's get this. So there's a dot get function that allows you to get any property by its name. So if I say f dot get this, you can get the value of the property. If you know that the value of this particular property is a number and we can see it's a number, you can directly use the get number function. The get number exists for dictionaries and features where uh, if you didn't have that, you have to say f dot get and then cast it to a number. So you have to say e dot number uh, and then convert to a number. If you already know that the value you're getting is a number, you can just use the get number function. 
So we got the number and that's our area that we got from that. We can say, I want to convert the area into square kilometers. So I can take the area and divide it by one E6. So one E6 is one followed by six zeros because to convert square kilometers to square meters, we need to divide by thousand times thousand. So uh, you can do divide one E6. And now we have the value that we want to set. So we can say, I want to return the same feature that was uh, sent to us, but now we're going to set a new property. We'll name this new property area square kilometers and assign the value that we just computed. So we have a function that takes one feature, extracts the value of this property and returns a new uh, the feature with a new property of the area in square kilometers. Let's map this on a collection and see the result. So we have our taluks. So I'm going to say taluks dot map, and we'll map this function add area. We'll save the results into a new variable. I'm going to name it taluks with area. This line will run this add area function to each feature in the taluks. There are over 200 features run on each of them in parallel, and it'll compute that and each feature will have a new property. Let's check if that worked. So I'm going to take this and just do dot first, just to check what's the resulting feature look like. So this was our original feature, nine properties. We have the new feature with the 10 properties and you have this new field area square kilometers. Once you know this, it's quite easy, but it's quite unintuitive for a GIS person to come and say, how do I add a new column to my feature collection? Well, you have to map function to do this. It's time for the exercise. Vigna, you can explain the exercise 6C.